So the campus ministry at the time was sending over initially a thousand college students and staff to Manila for the summer of 1990. U.S. military bases were under negotiation, so it became a little politically unstable. Car bombs were going off in January, so people started to drop out of this project. And then by the time we like landed, there were about 300, which is still a really large group, going from the United States all over the U.S. The week before we arrived, a U.S. Peace Corps representative is kidnapped. So now American missionaries are soft targets for the New People's Army, which is the communist guerrilla group in the Philippines. So hmm. we get there, and then our project leadership starts getting death threats and kidnapping threats and leave or die by, you know, the state. This is Where You're From, an origin story podcast at the intersection of faith and culture that digs into the influences and experiences that shape who we are today. Join us as we gain insight into the Bible's wisdom for all, regardless of where we're from. Hey, y'all, this is Rasul Berry. Thanks for joining me on Where You're From. This week, I am excited to share my conversation with Vivian Mabuni. Vivian is a national speaker, author, Bible teacher, and the host of Someday Is Here, a podcast for Asian American and Pacific Islander leaders. With over 30 years on staff with crew, Vivian loves teaching about the Bible and its practical application to life. You can find out more about Vivian by clicking the links in the show notes or by visiting whereyou'refrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Please join me as I ask my friend Vivian Mabuni where you're from. Well, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin and grew up in Boulder, Colorado and have lived the last three decades plus in California. Mm. So in doing my research, I discovered that that question where you're from is actually somewhat fraught with some complexity and uh, even some pain. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is sometimes been behind the surface of that question for you? Sure. Well, you know, I'm an Asian American, Chinese American woman. And historically, people that look like me have been othered. Mm. And that's where when someone asks me, where where are you from? Um, where are you really from? Generally, they're wanting to know my ethnic heritage. And it's interesting, I was talking with one of my white friends. And it was like, you know, if if they were asked the question, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Chicago. That's the end of the question. There's mm-hmm. not a second, where are you really from? So that's why, for me, I'm proud of my ethnic heritage. I don't mind talking about that. But what the question often evokes in me is this sense of othering mm-hmm. and a perpetual foreigner. Appreciate you sharing that. When did you first experience or discover this aspect of being seen as, when you say the other, is something different than one of us in air mm-hmm. quotes. Yeah. Well, growing up in Colorado, there were not a lot of Asian Americans. And I can remember even as a little girl during Valentine's Day, we would have these little mailboxes that each of us would make, and then we would all share Valentines with one another. And there was always this Valentine that was like a cartoon Japanese one. Mm -hmm. And I would get like 15 of those. There was just a sense that I looked different. And as much as I tried to fit in, I Mm. knew that I would never date the captain of the football team. So I tried everything to assimilate to majority culture. So I did cheerleading. I was the junior class president. I did, you know, all Mm. of the clubs and the activities, but there was always something inside that knew that I didn't fit in. How did that feel? Having this sense of, I want to find a sense of belonging, all kids do, right? Mm -hmm. I want to fit in, but also there's something about me that prevents me from fully fitting in. For me, as I look back now, I had recognized that I lived in two worlds. We spoke Chinese at home. My grandma lived with us. She made me the weird lunches. I just wanted a Lunchable and Ding Dongs. (laughs) And, And so... In order to fit in, I really needed to learn to to code switch, which meant I needed to learn to communicate like my white friends and be very direct and jump into conversations. And I also needed to kind of shut off 
the Asian part of me whenever I stepped out the door. Hmm. And I'm kind of sad about that when hmm. I think about it now. There was a part of me that just pushed down hmm. the rich cultural heritage hmm. where I I just didn't want to associate. Not to the degree, I have some uh, Asian American friends who stopped eating food from their hmm. country of origin and only ate hot dogs and refused to learn to use chopsticks. I had to that degree. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't quite there, but I remember just feeling shame in mm -hmm. how my family operated because it didn't look like what I watched on TV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it was taking off our shoes in the front door or anything like that, it was just a sense that we don't operate. We don't communicate. We don't operate. We are not like what I see around me. You talk about some of that rich cultural heritage. I'd love to hear more about it. So you mentioned your folks were in Colorado. What prompted them? Or like, I don't know how many generations back are we talking and how did they end up there? Yes, they are both really remarkable people. So they were both born in China. Mm. My mom was from Hangzhou and my dad was from Wuxi, which is in the Shanghai area. Mm -hmm. And when the Japanese invaded, they fled China to Taiwan and had to rebuild their lives there. They did well in school. My dad graduated from the Harvard of Taiwan, mm -hmm. Taiwan National University. In 1965 was when immigration laws were changing in the United States. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, in 1882, there's the Chinese Exclusion Act, which literally banned people of Chinese descent mm -hmm. from immigrating to our country. And it kept going for a long, long time. In 65, some of those immigration laws switched up and they were allowing more scholars to enter the country from, you know, Asian countries. And so my parents got their master's degree in Hawaii, and that's where they met and got married. And then my dad's first PhD programs in Wisconsin. So that's where I was born. I did not know until huh. I was married that my mom was just steps away from getting her PhD, but then she got pregnant with me. Wow. And I'm thinking, like, they are doing all of this upper graduate level in a second language. Mm. Like, you know, my mom had a scholarship for soil sciences or something like that. So she's learning like really challenging scientific things. I mean, words that we don't even know in English right. that she's learning in a second language. And so that really is remarkable to me. Mm. So my dad's first teaching job was at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Okay. So that's where the Colorado piece fit in. And we kind of came to Boulder around the same time, there were several other Chinese families, like a handful of Chinese families that also came to Boulder around the same time. And so that was like this little mini community where we would gather together for holidays or certain meals, eat the food, have all the kids together. <laughs> the parents are comparing the SAT scores or whatever, but it was like <laughs> poker and mahjong and that was their little community. That sounds sweet. Do you remember like enjoying the connection with this like smaller intimate community? I did. I remember there was shame that my parents, as intelligent as they are, they spoke with an accent, you know? And so to have all of these first generation kids, all of us born in the U.S., looking like we did, but we didn't speak with accents, there was just a comfortable settling like an exhale almost mm. to be together and to have this shared experience. But at school, it was like I had one Chinese friend mm. in elementary school. Mm. L literally, that was it. Then my cousin moved here uh, from Taiwan in, in fourth grade. And so he was my other Chinese friend at the school. So did you have siblings? I have a younger sister. Yeah. Okay. So are you like the classic older sister? Uh <laughs> Firstborn bossy one. My husband's like, you just never think you're wrong. So I'm like, I know you're right. So yes, I'm a, I am the firstborn. Yes. And tell me about the maybe cultural significance that being a firstborn had in your home that might yeah. even be distinct in some ways. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, for 5,000 years, you know, China has been steeped in Confucian teaching. Mm -hmm. And Confucian teaching for family and uh, just a high view of hierarchy in family. So it's taught for women, like when a daughter, you obey your father. When a wife, you obey your husband. When a widow, you obey your sons. Mm. So there's definitely a value for 
having sons over daughters. Mm. And I think it's for my my white friends who watch something like Downton Abbey, it's like the Crawley family on steroids. Like you have to have the male heir to carry on the name. So there's a high abortion rate for daughters Mm. in China because Mm. of the value of the son. So my parents never said anything to my face that, oh, I wish you were a son. But I knew in my bones the importance of the sun. And I think that that really fueled a lot of my performance, Hmm. this need to really make my parents proud and proud that they have a daughter instead Hmm. of a son. Man, that seems seems like the pressure didn't just, wasn't just outside to conform. It was even internal in in the home as well. So in the mix of that, tell me a little bit about Boulder, Colorado. I mean, I've heard, you know, I know the big university, the Buffalo and all that. Yeah, but, go see you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and again, you, it sounds like your parents, in a sense, were insiders into that community. And the fact that your dad was teaching there, your mom was no stranger to academy herself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, just tell us a little bit about Boulder as you remembered it growing up. Yeah, well, Boulder is one of the weird cities in our nation. It's you know, scented with pine trees and marijuana. <laughs> it's just, and so I feel very at home in cities like Portland and mm. Berkeley and Austin and Madison. I love the quirkiness of it. And mm. there are a lot of parts of Boulder that I love. And my dad, very unconventional to your standard Chinese engineer, doctor, he went the theater route. And he has, in fact, translated a lot of Shakespeare into Chinese and had it performed around the world. It's fascinating. So he was the he was the producer of the Colorado Shakespeare Festival um, for decades. He was the producer that actually finished the whole canon. So wow. I grew up in this whole subculture of this theater world. You know, but it was interesting because I still remember at the age of nine, my dad directed Romeo and Juliet. I went with him to every rehearsal. I had the entire play memorized. I was spotting lines for all of the characters because I just knew because I had been there. And I remember getting into the car after one of the rehearsals and my dad just saying, it's just too bad you'll never play Juliet because you're Chinese. Mm. And that just underscored for me Mm. growing up in Boulder that there were things that were going to not be possible for me because of how I looked. So even if I went out for a part in a play, I knew I would never get the lead because it didn't fit my profile. It's changed more in recent times, but for the most part, you know, Asian Americans are the sidekick or the the nerdy person. They're never the love interest or the lead. And until recently, that just was never, ever, ever seen. You know, Mm. every episode I grew up watching, it was just embarrassing Mm. to see a portrayal of someone that Mm. looked like me. So was your father's immediate, like when he moved to uh, teach at University of Colorado, it was for theater? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was a professor of theater. And my mom ended up teaching Mandarin at the university, she actually Hmm. got tenured and then she quit because the pay was so awful. You know, so she's always kind of been an entrepreneur, you know, so she opened up restaurants, which like now restaurants are really cool. But back then I was so mortified. I'm like, you have a master's degree. Why are you opening up a Chinese restaurant? But I remember having this other life too, where I worked at the Chinese restaurant, our restaurant, you know, and had this whole other experience with immigrant chefs that are paid under the table and all the things that were not in academia. It was like, mm. this is kind of the the Chinese American story of whether it's the laundromat or the Chinese restaurant. Like there was, there was some of that wow. in my growing up as well that shaped me. So you've had a lot of streams shaping you, like coming <laughs> together and making yes. the fabulousness that is a oh. living. So as you are experiencing these like different aspects of Colorado, of Boulder, of your Chinese family, what was your spiritual life like? Yeah, so we were culturally Buddhist. It's kind of like the cartoon Mulan or Coco, where during certain holidays we would uh, burn incense and fix these really elaborate meals, and we would kowtow and invite the spirits of the dead ancestors to come, and that's how we would honor. So it was cultural in that it never impacted my life at all. Like I never learned anything about Buddhism, except for that we did these 
ceremonies here and there. Then in high school, I sat next to my friend in math class and watched her start glowing. And I looked at her and I said, what happened to you? Did you become a vegetarian? And she goes, no, I became a Christian. And I'm like, really? (laughs) And I was so disappointed because my friend was funny and smart. And I was just like, how could you be duped into this mythology? But she sat next to me, Russell, and it was just undeniable that God was real in her life. And so that started me on a spiritual journey. And I went to a youth group because they were cute boys. I had questions like, what about the problem of pain? If God is mm. good, why does he allow all these awful things to happen? What mm. about the other religions? What about people who never hear about Jesus? Why is Jesus the only way? Mm. What about the Bible? How can we trust it? All those kinds of questions were questions that I had. And what grade were you in? when you? I was a um, sophomore in high school. Where do you think some of your um, skepticism about Christ and Christianity came from? I think it was growing up in Boulder, really. You know, there was, you know, it's just, I remember writing papers about ESP and the pyramids of Egypt and UFOs and, you know, like Ouija boards. I mean, it was just, it was so spiritually open-minded. Right. And so my understanding at the time was that whatever this Christianity thing was, it's very narrow and it's blind faith. Hmm. You know, I so it was really helpful because my youth pastor actually took me out you know, grabbed a lemonade. And as we talked, it was like, wow, there is actually an intellectual basis for the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And I began, you know, trying to understand more. I went out and bought a Bible. We didn't have a Bible at home. So I drove to the mall, bought a Bible. (laughs) I tried reading it and it was really dull and boring. And Mm -hmm. like, what are all of these measurements about this temple and these kings with names I can't pronounce? And, (laughs) you know, just uh, nothing made sense. And then I tried to live this Christian life. Like, I remember going with a different friend to church one of the few times I'd ever been, and the pastor saying something about opening your heart's door and asking Christ to come into your life. And I thought, I've never done that before. So I I looked back over journals and realized, you know, I didn't feel any different, but I think I, you know, something changed Mm. when I understood that. But then I tried to live this Christian life in my own energy and effort. And was so frustrated because before I could just lower my standards, um, you know, and just kind of live okay. Now I knew right from wrong and could not live consistently right. Mm. So that's when I thought, this is just a phase I'm going through. I'm tossing this one out the window. And then my dad goes through midlife crisis. And after 17 years in Boulder, Colorado, he moves our entire family right before my senior year. And we were moving to Hong Kong where they don't speak Mandarin. They speak Cantonese, which is, it might as well be Polish. It was like, there's no comprehension. And when we moved to Hong Kong, I gave God this ultimatum prayer. I was so angry and so devastated, you know. Mm. So I just sat down and I just said, God, I need a church. I need some Christian friends, a youth group. If you do that, if you provide that for me here in Hong Kong, I will give you my whole life. I will hold nothing back. Otherwise, I'm going to go out and get drunk and do something I'll probably regret, but I'm never talking to you again. And so these little prayers were lifted up to the Lord in Hong Kong of all places. And wouldn't you know, Russell, God came through in Hong Kong. Mm. Long story short, there's a little Christian Missionary Alliance church that was walking distance to our home. There were actually some crew staff that were embedded there that were trying to get into China. I learned to share the four spiritual laws there. The very first youth group, we learned about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And it was like, this is it. This was what was missing. And I ended up getting discipled and shared my faith. And just Hong Kong became such an amazing place that I am so grateful for. What was your internal reaction like when you had to come to grips with moving to halfway around the world? Well, so what's so interesting is that my experience living internationally, like as an expat, Mm. you know, learning currency, you know, it's a British colony at the time. So, you know, the driving's on the other side of the road. I Mm. mean, the culture shock, there was no one to navigate the culture shock and then the language barrier and then looking like I do. Like I remember standing on Nathan Road in Hong Kong. So there's 6 million people there. (laughs) Like I look out over the sea of people and I told my parents, I said, 
If I were to count every single Chinese person I've ever seen in my life, mm -hmm. in, including if it was my aunt and I saw her five times as five different people, they would not come close to the amount of Chinese people I see in this very moment standing on this bridge. And what was fascinating about that was that I still didn't feel like I fit in. Mm. Even though I looked like people around me, you know, I dream in English. Mm. My values have been shaped by growing up in the United States. Like my my identity is still not true of this country of origin, even though Hong Kong wasn't my country of origin, but being right. with other Chinese people did not make me feel like I fit in either. Right. And so there's that tension again of like, well, where do I fit in? So when I read material about third culture kids, mm. uh, that resonates as an Asian American. Like that is like, I don't feel like I fit in neither here nor there in this liminal space. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's one thing I want to circle back to. You, you talked about earlier becoming aware of being the other and the whole trope of the perpetual foreigner that mm. Asian Americans often experience being. I'm curious about what was your encounter with being in a, another type of other when you went to Hong Kong? And how was that different, same than what you would experience in the U.S.? Yeah, that's a great question, Russell. For me, it was different in Hong Kong because if I kept my mouth closed, no one would know. Mm. Whereas just me walking into a room here, everybody knows. Mm. So... This is probably true of most Asian Americans growing up in the United States in predominantly white spaces. But for me, I scan the room and I notice every single person of color. I notice every Asian for sure. And typically we make eye contact and kind of like do the, hey, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> like, I get you, you get me. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a knowing. So, but in Hong Kong, it was really like, if I kept my mouth closed, no one would know. It was as soon as I opened my mouth that they realized I did not speak Cantonese or the little that I had picked up was clearly not like from the land. <laughs> so then again, feeling othered, but it was a familiar feeling in some ways too. And I think it's interesting to see how being from the United States at times was a benefit. Like, mm. So for me, being an American wasn't looked down upon. Right. And honestly, it, it can kind of be ugly American as mm -hmm. well. You yeah. know, the reputation of entitlement and yeah. special treatment that goes with this right. passport. So as a believer, trying to navigate yeah. that part um, and not take advantage of that, gotcha. I think is important to keep in mind. So I think as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, I don't think I had the right. wherewithal to understand, but I knew enough right. that it did influence. Okay. So with that in mind, you come back to the States. You come back to where you had left, to what was mm -hmm. home, but you come back now with a whole different <laughs> palette of experiences having been yes. in you know Hong Kong for a year. How do you come back different? Ooh. Well, it's so fun because I connected back with, with my high school friends. And I remember one of my good friends, he's just like, you're a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jesus was real in my life and he had been changing my character because I used to have such a horrible sailor mouth. And it's just, mm. so I think my friends coming back and seeing like, wow, you really probably like became the religious person, you know, but I desperately wanted them to know the Lord, mm. you know, and just having tasted that God is real and that He could be so intimate in my life, I wanted that for them as well. So I didn't know how to communicate my faith as well, but they were seeing the changes that were going on. And I don't think it was just that, you know, I attended church, that they were literally noticing a change in disposition, mm. you know, that I seemed nicer. <laughs> Got it. So with that, you come back. You know, you're nicer. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you know. I used to think I was nice, and then I got married. So <laughs> it's just like, oh, still. Okay, so mm. then what happened? So I didn't have a guidance counselor. So the only school I knew was the University of Colorado in Boulder. And so my parents were like, well, just apply for the business school. You know, and so it was practical. So I'm like, okay. And so I got into the University of Colorado, Boulder, and was heading back to to Boulder. And I remember sitting with my youth pastor saying, I don't want 
what I've just experienced this last year to be just a phase. Mm -hmm. And I don't want it to be based on this place with these people. So what should I do? And he's like, well, look up Navigators, InterVarsity, Campus Crusade for Christ. As soon as you get to campus, go. And I was like, okay, that's what I'll do. And um, Hmm. I remember having a very sincere prayer, like, okay, Lord, you were so real in Hong Kong. I have no idea what awaits me here in Boulder, but I don't. I don't want to, I don't want you to leave me on the shelf Mm -hmm. and I don't want to not know you like I've known you in Mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Would you just come through? And boy, did he, like I was involved with a very dynamic, the golden years at the University of Colorado. And we had up to 400 at our weekly meetings and just some of the most phenomenal leaders that Mm -hmm. are still serving the Lord in so many capacities all around the world that came out of that season wow. of ministry. So what was something that stuck out to you about that season of your life? Oh, I just love it. I think that there was so much fresh faith. Hmm. Um, we just we were trusting the Lord and we were doing it in community. And there was generations of multiplying disciples. And hmm. so there was just these beautiful relationships that, you know, still to this day, we, hmm. you know, there are relationships that are still there. Um I I think that it was a sense of what I picture uh, the body of Christ in a healthy way is that we are all linking arms facing out, Mm. you know, so we have each other's backs, but we're not so bent out of shape about the music, you know, like, yes, music is important and I don't want to downplay that, but there was something bigger going on and that we would make a little bit of a difference in our university, but have our whole vision shifted to live for more than just, you know, our own happiness. That Mm. was really, really powerful. Oftentimes there's a uh, conflict or tension between what kind of people look at as like a progressive liberal arts university and like a dynamic Christian faith and experience. And usually one of those is seen as maybe white evangelical and the other one is kind of more multi-ethnic. And yet you kind of don't fit any of those categories, right? So I'm just curious of how that being at Boulder as a student Mm. in a faith community, like how you thought about those categories, how did you engage with those as Mm -hmm. well? And then even blow them up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... I think when I returned to Colorado, being in this predominantly white, right. you know, um, ministry, it was absolutely code switching again. And then looking back and going, gosh, we were in some really racist skits, you know, like things that were just like, there were like three or four other Asians in the whole group, you know, and, mm. you know, we'd be asked to do these skits or whatever. And it was like, ha ha, this is funny. And not even realizing that, no, this was not funny. We mm. don't make fun of my people. (laughs) And I think there's an ethnic journey that we all go on, and we are all in different parts of our journey. And what I've learned is that there are a lot of factors that play into what the unfolding of this journey looks like. So for, you know, sometimes with my white friends who have a Black friend or an Asian friend, you know, like they feel like the single story explains everything, but it's not. It's like, it's so much more complex and nuanced. And with this idea of ethnic journey, I think, you know, back in the day, early on in my early 20s, if my friend said, oh, I don't even think of you as Chinese or Asian, I just think of you as Viv, I would have taking that to be a compliment Mm. at the time, because it was just like, okay, I achieved what I was hoping to do, which is the melting pot and Mm. assimilation. And let's all just be kind of this, this mixture soup. But that really ultimately meant that I'm just erasing a whole part of my, my life and heritage and what makes me who I am. Mm. And so the pendulum swung again to the other side where it's like, I really see that the the church capital C church misses and little C right. church misses out when we don't have representation yeah. and when we don't have voices that are different than mm. mainstream and I would just say to my white friends they're not just white <laughs> they are norwegian american right. swedish american french american and the italian american is not the same as the polish american or the right. german american so 
we all bring in mm -hmm. these parts of who yeah. we are. And it sounds like you're saying it, it unfolded in layers and steps. So, okay, so you graduate from college and then what? <laughs> and then it was deciding between law school, you know, and joining staff with Crew, Campus mm. Crusade. Um, I just loved everything that I was a part of mm. when I was involved in college. And so I told my non-Christian parents, you know, I'd like to do this for two years. I can always go back to law school, right. but I would love to do this for two years. Interestingly, I requested to go to Berkeley or to UCLA because of the large Asian population. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work with Asian Americans like right. me. So going back to that, the the small group of Chinese families that came with my parents, mm -hmm. there was one Christian family. And hmm. so everyone is uncle and auntie, you know, in Asian culture. So they're all uncles and aunties. And part of being- And what's the, on, what was the word that you would have used to say uncle or auntie? So it changes based on their age. Okay. So if the gentleman is older than my dad, then he's bubba. If he's younger, then he's susu. So you have to know if he's older or younger. Got it. So Uncle Peter was part of the one lone Christian family that was in this group. So part of joining staff was that I would have to raise financial support. Mm -hmm. And my parents, you know, that is just a foreign concept. So they went to one of these, these parties. And I did not know this. I was back home. Uncle Peter pulls my parents aside. He says, um, you know, I want you to look around, like everyone's comparing their kids to each other, like their jobs, their schools they went to and all that stuff. I want you to know that I wish that my daughter could do what your daughter's doing. Wow. He said, I want you to know that as a Christian, part of my worship to God is to give part of my money to churches and missionaries like your daughter. I am so proud of your daughter, and I think that you should be proud of her too. So he tells this to them, and they come home, and they tell me what Uncle Peter had said. The three of us are crying. Like, we have never, like, and so at the end of this conversation, my dad goes, I want to support you from my gambling fund. <laughs> <laughs> and so he pulls out his checkbook, and he writes me a check to, to be on staff. And um, it was, uh, that was a God moment, for sure. And it was a confirmation that God was doing something there's so many layers to that, right? Like there's the community that was your first community where you felt like you could be yourself. Mm -hmm. Then there's the cultural significance of someone in authority blessing this yeah. journey and especially because of his faith. And then it's him advocating yes. for, for your parents. And then it's your own parents writing the check yeah. and he don't even... <laughs> That's yes. amazing. Yes. Wow. That must have been, that must have been a, a day. It was a day. And I think for, I want my parents to be proud of me. I still want my sure. parents to be proud of me. And the, that I had their blessing that way mm. was huge. And God ended up raising my support in six and a half weeks. And I reported to Berkeley. So it was just like, wow. it was confirmation that this is what I was to do. When we come back, Vivian will share about some amazing success she had working in campus ministry, only to be rocked by a devastating diagnosis. That's coming next on Where You're From. This episode is brought to you by Preaching Today. Are you tired of chasing down quality sermon illustrations? Need fresh ideas for helping your message connect? Each week, Preaching Today adds fresh content to our database of over 14,000 editor screened illustrations. Quickly find the right story that will bring your message to life and help your people move closer to God. Get started today at preachingtoday.com. What's up, where you're from, listeners? You like free stuff, right? Well, check this out to hear how you can get my favorite set of earphones, Power Beats Pro. I use these when I work out, cook, and when I'm listening to my favorite podcasts, like where you're from. How can you enter to win the giveaway? Simply fill out our brief survey by clicking on the link in the show notes. Once you do that, you're entered to win. It's just that simple. So won't you do it right now? You'll have until November 7th, the day of the last episode of season five to enter. Thanks for listening to where you're from. Peace, y'all. 
Hey, y'all, before we get back to our conversation with Vivian Mabuni, I wanted to share a quick teaser from our next episode with the artist Propaganda. This is where you're from. So when you come around that alley, you know, who's outside, you know, you slap boxing, having fun, whatever, right? When you come around the alley and then when they meet up with they homies, you know, and then the click clack pop the trunk, you know what I'm saying? And, and then all the cuz cuz start happening. <laughs> and you start just that that feeling as a child, like I may not, I may not make it back home. You know, like when you when it hits you, like they, they signed up for this. You know, then you just like like little stuff. You just start noticing, like man, we this little and all the scars all over your face and your body. It's like this isn't normal. Like you fell off your skateboard or just normal boy stuff it's just like nah this is from like violence now let's get back into our conversation with vivian mabuni on where you're from okay so now you're at berkeley you see berkeley Berkeley. california go bears yes (laughs) loved it did you feel prepared and in what ways was it different than boulder I actually felt like so fired up. I was just ready to go. So it was like I hit the ground and, you know, found the freshmen and we, you know, built this beautiful like mini community in the midst of the bigger community. And we saw God do great things and we had fun and we stayed up way too late and just it was it was wonderful. I loved my time there. And I imagine, too, one of the other things is demographically, it's different being in California. A lot more people that look like you. Yes. In fact, Russell, I was driving across the bridge into the Bay Area and I looked to the left. Oh, there's an Asian. <laughs> I looked to the right. Oh, there's another Asian. <laughs> so it's just like, oh, my goodness, I was in the promised land <laughs> and then got to campus and didn't realize that there was so much history that I did not know about warring factions like the Japanese don't get along with the Koreans who don't get along with the, mm. and who look. And people don't like the people from, you know, it's just like there was a lot that I did not know. I was just happy to be with people who look like me and did not realize that there was a lot of history Mm. and animosity between certain people groups at times. Mm. And learning to navigate that was a whole journey as well, coming in without that knowledge. I refer to myself more often than not as an Asian American. I'm an American born Chinese, but Asian American... I think the term came to pass in the 60s, I believe, at Mm -hmm. Berkeley, I think, as solidarity, like let's link arms. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I even understood how, for me as a woman of color, I stand on the shoulders of my black brothers and sisters who fought for civil liberty, civil rights. And I mean, there's just so much history that I did not know. And that has been such a beautiful and also painful realization of Mm. all that I have not known because I just kind of come skipping in thinking, oh, everyone looks like me. We should all get along (laughs) and needing to take a few steps back and really honor the stories and, and, and single out even the stories of different people because my Hmong brothers and sisters do not have the same experience as my Japanese American friends have. Yeah. Man, it sounds like Berkeley was a, a great experience. How long were you there? I was only there for two years. It flew by. Wow. Um, I fell in love with Darren, my husband. Um, okay. Yeah. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Pause. Yeah. Time out. How did that happen? Just, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I love that I can have this conversation with her. So part of Crew is that Crew likes to do really big things. And so the summer of 1990, mm-hmm. uh, they decided to to have 102 nations and all the ministries of crew show up in Manila for like, let's reach Metro Manila of 8.5 million people. Let's just throw everything at it. So every ministry of all the people. So the campus ministry at the time was sending over initially a thousand college students and staff to Manila for the summer of 1990. U.S. military bases were under negotiation. So it became a little politically unstable. Car bombs were going off in January. So people started to drop out of this project. And then by the time we like landed, there were about 300, which is still a really large group, going from the United States all over the U.S. The week before we arrived, a U.S. Peace Corps representative is kidnapped. 
So now American missionaries are soft targets for the New People's Army, which is the communist guerrilla group in the Philippines. So Mm. we get there, and then our project leadership starts getting death threats and kidnapping threats and leave or die by, you know, the state. And so they did a massive pivot and decided we cannot afford to have one of our college students get kidnapped for showing the Jesus film. So we will relocate and go to Bangkok, Thailand. So 240 went to Bangkok, Thailand. An option was available for Asian Americans to stay in Manila because we blend in. And so Mm. there's one staff guy, Darren Mabuni, and one staff gal, me, (laughs) and this group of 23. We're like Gideon's army. You know, we just down to- Just kept whittling down. Yes, whittling down. So we ended up leading this team. So the 20, our team of 25, we survived a 7.7 earthquake. Um, we saw- Oh, because de- death threats wasn't enough. No, it's signs and wonders <laughs> and all the beautiful things. So we literally, I mean, it was amazing. And and in the course of the summer, we saw over 700 people come to Christ. I mean, it was unbelievable. Okay, I just got to add, because that, 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 that's hardcore. It was- like. <laughs> It's one thing for something to jump off when you but when you in country and it's like, well, we didn't know. It's another thing to have a whole like <laughs> rollout months ahead of time <laughs> with warnings. What was it about you that decided or what you had heard that said, I'm supposed to be here in spite of the potential dangers? Well, I just wanted to be with my best friend that I came on staff with. And so I was Mm. actually assigned to the Pacific Northwest because she was on that team. Wow! So I was crushed because I wasn't going to spend the summer with my best friend that I come on staff with because she went to Uh. Thailand. But I ended up with this amazing man who we led this team together and we we were such a great team. So Mm. we fell in love and then he said, you know, we need to deal with this after we get back to country. You know, I'm like, you're right. So that made me like him even more, you know. So <laughs> it was just, and this is before cell phones. This is before, mm. you know, Facebook mm-hmm. or anything like that. So we literally had to babysit these walkie-talkies that we had to keep mm. on 24 hours surveillance just in case we had to be evacuated. So it was like, it was like crazy. Like, I don't know if I would let my daughter do this. <laughs> But we're like, okay, you know, let's just do this. And it was Yo, this this could be a movie. It could be a like, movie. <laughs> you know, that that is that is beautiful. <laughs> that is a beautiful story. And tell me a little bit more about Darren. So Darren is um uh born and raised in Hawaii. He grew up on the big island and um mm. he comes from a great family. His mom tragically passed away from um mm. a heart attack when he was in high school. And so mm. that just drove him with his grief to just a lot of destructive behavior. But through a friendship with um, Warren in college, he trusted Christ and got involved mm. with the Ministry of Crew and was walking down a path to go into the medical field. And then when he just got captured by, you know, how God could change not only a physical life, but a spiritual life, he was like, mm. I want to be involved with that. So. So he had joined staff and was on staff at UCLA. He has the gift of faith. So it was like, I don't know if he actually finished raising his support, but he just showed up to be on this Manila thing. Like his his support coach was like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm going to Manila. It was just one of those things where he just had uh, the gift of faith and he was at the right place at the right time. Y'all, I wish <laughs> y'all could see the smile on her face as she talks about her husband of how many years? 32. 32 years. Congratulations. And the love is still there. <laughs> and the joy is still there. It, it is it's cute. It's very adorable. Well. And it's more than that because this is a power couple. And that's how I met you being the power couple on you know stage. And I was like, they're so cool. <laughs> That was my like. I, I was just like, they're they're just they're attractive, witty, the banter back and forth. That was my like first oh, Darren and, and Vivian experience. That's like, so funny. I had no idea. Yes, oh. yes. So how long after the amazing journey, missionary experience of uh, Manila, to you guys get married? And oh my gosh, together? it was cra- again. Like I would not recommend this for my kids. <laughs> we before we left country, he said. Let's just pray and seek some counsel, and I'll call you at the end of the month. You know, so we had like a month to kind of, you know, wrap things up. And so he calls me at the end of the month and then eventually just drives up to see me a month after we had returned 
to country and we started dating officially. And three months later, we got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when did you tell your kids this oh story? Oh my it was like, goodness, <laughs> I'm like, no, just don't even. Like, right. And Darren actually to this day is like, that's fine. You know, if that's what it is. And I'm like, no, what are we? So it was, it's hilarious. Mm. And then we got married the following summer and we were long distance. So I did not know the man I married. <laughs> and so wow. marriage has been Super challenging, super rewarding, mm. but still, like, you know, 32 years in, it's work still. It's still, yeah. you have to be intentional. You mentioned he's from Hawaii, mm-hmm. with, you know, which that can mean a lot of different things. So what is his uh, ethnic background and story? So he grew up in Hilo, which is predominantly Japanese. So okay. his grandparents came over from Okinawa, which is part of the chain of Japanese islands. So it's interesting because I used to just say he's Japanese, but he's actually Okinawan. And there's a difference in wanting to honor that as well, knowing that now that Okinawan, you know, the language is different, the culture, everything. And Okinawa has been colonized by different people groups over history, which again, I did not know. But he is probably most formed by Japanese culture. So when we did missions in Japan... Like, I woke up realizing this entire country functions like my husband. (laughs) But before, I just thought that was just Darren, you know, Mm. instead of recognizing there's this beautiful honoring of the collective Mm. over the individual, the awareness of people around you, where we have had cultural clashes in our marriage. Because, you know, I'm in bolder, white, this is how you do life. And so we, for example, walking across the street— I'm like in the crosswalk and it's the little walk sign is, you know, it's not even flashing. It just says walk. So I am walking in between the lines and he's hurrying me up. And it's because there's another car wanting to turn right, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm a pedestrian. I am in the lines. It's not right. even flashing walk right now. This is my right as a pedestrian to walk. Mm-hmm. And he's like, we are a part of a community. And so if Mm. there are other people trying to get places, we are aware of others. I'm like, oh, I repent. (laughs) So so I've learned a lot being married to Darren, but we communicate very differently. He communicates indirectly. Like, where should we eat? Well, maybe we should go to you know, Chipotle. And I'm like, yeah, or maybe we could go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. (laughs) And so his maybe is actually what he wants. And so learning to decipher that has been full of challenges. Wow, that's great. And and I think the other thing I initially experienced you all as leaders in Epic. Tell me about what is Epic and how did your journey as a couple find its way there? Yes. So we did 28 years of campus ministry in total. Mm -hmm. And probably in the late 90s, early 2000s, really felt burdened, especially with demographics changing in California and around the country, really wanted to help to give lift and some leadership to Asian American ministry in particular. So the name Epic came about before it became its own branch of the campus ministry. (laughs) And um, we were doing some stuff already. Darren was working with ethnic field ministry and all of that. And then in 2007, the campus ministry made more changes to really recognize Epic as the Asian American ministry of the campus ministry Uh, having our own executive team and leadership. And so we joined that national executive team right at the Mm. beginnings. And um, Darren served as the field director for a number of years. And I had joined that team and then was diagnosed with breast cancer, which switched Mm. things up massively. So that was three days before Christmas of 2008. So all of 2009, I was walking through my breast cancer journey and active treatment and all of that. So that kind of took things in a different direction in many ways. Mm. When you look back on your own experiences in Boulder, in college, going to Berkeley, what was it about your own journey that prompted you to see the importance of EPIC and reaching Asian American college students in a way that was unique Mm -hmm. than what was typically being offered. Yeah. Well, when Darren and I were doing campus ministry at UCLA, I I can remember in particular um, several guys that came up to Darren and said, hey, we would love for you to mentor us. You know, they did not feel comfortable in 
the ministry that currently existed. Like when they came to the weekly meeting, they'd sit in the back. It was very loud and a lot of people in the fraternities and sororities. And Mm. it just didn't feel comfortable. You know, just how the room felt didn't feel like this is who I am. Mm. And so Darren, you know, having the wherewithal to see like, you know, Asians don't promote themselves. They don't say, hey, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. You know, it's kind of like, no, it's you are invited into that space and you are invited and challenged and rise up to that challenge. But that, again, is a very cultural thing. And so seeing that there are a lot of gifted leaders Mm. who would not otherwise Mm. be a part of the current ministry as it was really was prompting us to say, hey, could we do this a little bit differently and see what could happen? Yeah, so those same things you were learning in your marriage about the right way to approach a crosswalk, <laughs> right? Yes. And, and the sense of deference mm-hmm. that, you know, your own husband kind of had, you know, like you saw that same thing playing itself out in in ministry context. Mm-hmm. And so all of these ways, right, in which the dominant culture could overlook this group or even just cause them to feel less like themselves, less yep. at home, you all saw an important opportunity to step up and speak into. Yeah, that's right. That makes a lot of sense. And then you drop the bomb that in the midst of all that, so you're doing this great work, it's 2008, and you get this diagnosis. Like, first of all, you know, when I think about breast cancer today, I think about every year, the NFL, you know, you see the pink and you. it's all very celebrated and normalized Mm. now in a way that just 15, 20 years ago, it was not, and especially in Christian circles. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that time period and what would have been the reality for entering into that kind of a diagnosis in a health situation Mm. in your context where you were. You know, I think the two words together, breast cancer, are two words that are loaded. You know, like (laughs) to have a more private part of my life be something that's like, this is a type of cancer. So that even 30 years ago was just even more so shunned. Like people just didn't talk about it. Um, Women didn't want to even be screened because it's just, there's shame that's Mm -hmm. a part of that. So learning to be able to speak up and say, I was diagnosed with breast cancer has its own threshold for me to kind of move through. Mm -hmm. There's also a part of culture of not wanting to put anybody out. Mm -hmm. And so in my story, I I see God's hand in preparing me for this diagnosis. I had um, been leading a group of Asian American women, moms, actually. Their kids had come to our little church for vacation Bible school. The kids had come to Christ, and these moms, several of them did not have like a a Christian background. So we were meeting to kind of explain Old Testament, New Testament, the little dots meaning chapter, verse, that kind of thing. And uh, one of the women shared about the the woman in the neighborhood with the reputation of being the Asian Martha Stewart. Like she was always, you know, so put together, and her home was always clean, and the kids were so polite, and the food she made was, was great, and her life was flawless. And then this woman was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when people found out in the neighborhood, they wanted to help. She had two kids and she just pushed everyone away. She was just like, no, 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 I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then as she underwent her cancer treatment, she was no longer able to hold her perfect world together. And she tragically took her own life. Mm. And so that story was shared with me in October And I felt like the Lord just kind of did one of those freeze the moment, tap me hard on the shoulder and said, Viv, you do not even know this Asian Martha Stewart, but you're just like her. Mm. You like to be the strong one. You like to help others. And you have a hard time letting people in. And I just looked up to the sky, you know, in the midst of all the conversation going around. I was just like, you know what, Lord, you're right. So I purpose right here, right now, if anything like this happens to me, I will let people in. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those Deuteronomy 31 where the Lord goes before you kind of things, because I had no idea that three months later, three days before Christmas, I would get the call. And so it was like, that changed everything, Russell. That changed my whole approach to 
allowing community to be a part of this journey and learning to be a gracious receiver, which so uncomfortable. Like I like to, I like to be the strong one. I like to be the one to, you know, help others and to be in a place where I had to learn to receive was really, really challenging and soul altering in a really, really good way. It is so helpful. Thank you for for just helping us to understand the uh, the stigma that was so associated with even the two words together, mm-hmm. breast cancer. So, what was that journey like for you? In turn, I don't. How long did it last? The the battle and what was some of the major experiences that you took away from that? Yeah, it was probably nearly an entire year of active treatment. So I underwent surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy, lost all my hair. Uh, Mm. Darren shaved his head bald all the days I was bald. It was really, really meaningful. And at the time, prior to the diagnosis, I had been running three to four miles every other day. Like I was as healthy as I had been. I did not Mm. feel sick Mm. at that point. Uh, the tumor was three by five centimeters. So mm. staged at either 2B or 3, and it had spread to three spots in my lymph nodes. So I had mm. to have all my lymph nodes removed as well. So, man, it was the worst of times. And it was also such an amazing experience to be loved so well. Mm. Like, I think our whole church had our little garage code memorized and just brought over the steady stream of meals and groceries and, you know, people who were coordinating rides. We were trying to keep life as normal as possible. The kids were young. You know, Jonathan had just started high school and Julie was in first grade. So trying to keep their activities up and just, it was a rallying of so many different streams of lives of people Mm. who we had been a part of, whether it was our crew family or our church family, you know, our school community and so forth. So, God used cancer to pull the writer out of me. Like I, Mm. you know, it was through that that I, my best friend had set up a Caring Bridge medical blog that I was writing on and people would share the posts with other people, Mm. you know, and that's what caused, you know, an editor from Our Daily Bread to reach out to me through an author I'd never met who knew of this blog post to see if I had a book proposal, which I had to Google book proposal. So I didn't, even get my literary agent until I was like well into the evaluation process for my book. So unexpected ways that God was at work. Amazing. When you say God used cancer to pull the writer out of me, again, that's a very poetic way to say it, what you expect from a writer. But <laughs> tell me a little bit more about that, like about how that circumstance led to you discovering this aspect of yourself. So I think, you know, there's a part of me that feels like in order to feel confident, I need to have some kind of, I need to be an English major or have written for the high school yearbook or, you know, editor of the school newspaper or something that would help me feel more confident. Mm -hmm. So writing to me, Russell, I'm a speaker who writes rather than a writer who speaks. Like my lead foot every time will be to speak. And I love, love, love that. That part, I feel like I've embraced and has that's just been my greatest joy. Writing is so intimidating for me. I feel so, I don't know, like I'm a part of a few different women's writer groups and I don't, I have a hard time even composing the emails to them sometimes because they're like the real writers. <laughs> I just think, I'm just like, oh, you write such great emails. I can't even put words together. So I feel intimidated very easily. But when it came to sharing in this this space of that Caring Bridge like journal, this medical journal, that felt like holy ground. Like there was no editing, mm-hmm. there was no trying to figure like the stories just came and I just wrote about them and God used it as a worship. As it was very worshipful. Mm-hmm. And in that There's no needing to tie a bow Mm. and make it pretty. It was just what it was in the in that moment. And for whatever reason that that ministered to people. And I was getting feedback like, I'm not going through cancer, but what you just shared, those principles are exactly what I needed to hear. Mm. And that's what kind of thought, oh, wow, like it's another medium to influence. So it sounds like you 
were able to experience a level of self forgetfulness hmm. that allowed you to be you and to not have to filter it through your perfectionist tendencies. Mm, wow. That's very insightful and very true. Yes. Mm. Yes. And maybe that's what I need to do to get another book out there because it's like that labor is very, it's just different. Yeah. It's a very different form of teaching and communicating. Well, you know, beyond that, you decided to go into podcasting. Someday is here, mm -hmm. which I, I think there's a story behind that title that I love to hear. So tell us a little bit about that and why you decided to get into podcasting. Oh, yeah. I love the story. So so back in 2015, I was part of the IF gathering. We did a racial reconciliation roundtable type conversation. And Latasha Morrison was part of it and a bunch of other people. I really wasn't familiar with anything that was going on. But at the end of the conference, Jenny... Alan always has some kind of an action point, like something to kind of mark the moment. And that year it was dominoes. Like if you write your dream and then our dominoes hit other people's dominoes and we kind of have this domino effect was kind of the impetus. And so this conference was being live streamed around the world. And uh, at the end, she just had some people share their domino. And so she had come up to me in the backstage and said, I really would love you to share your domino. And I was like, oh, I don't want to share my domino. And then walking backstage down the stairwell, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, no, you need to share your domino. And I'm like, okay. So I kind of got up there to the microphone. I said, you know, basically something to the effect of y'all are great, but none of you look like me. And so my domino says, I'd like to help raise up the next generation of Asian American Christian women leaders. Mm -hmm. So that went out and my now friends were actually – at the time, listening, going, people were texting each other, she's talking about you. Like, that was like, it It was a moment. And then I just put the domino on my little shelf and forgot about it. <laughs> and life went on and things kept going. And then my book, um, Open Hands, Willing Heart, was about to be uh, released in 2019. So it was New Year's Eve of 2018. And for the first time in the history of our family, all of us were in different places for New Year's. Mm. So I was driving home from my parents to Riverside, California, to be with one of my best friends for New Year's Eve. So I'm leaving on a Sunday morning. The streets are empty. I have my Spotify playlist worship going. I'm in the fast lane. Hands are raised. I am like, open hands, willing heart, God. It's, it's, this is the year. We're going into 2019. And I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, this huge RV shows up out of nowhere and drives in front of me. And I'm looking around going, okay, there are so many other lanes in this fast lane. And I mean, why? And I look up and there's a big fish sticker. And then the word someday is now. And so I was just like, really? And I look up and I was like, someday is now. So I wrote that down, that phrase down and um, thought, huh, I wonder what that means. So anyway, long story short, gathered a group of Asian American women we had an amazing time, and then the domino came back, and it was like, and I scribbled on another like podcast. I have the name. Someday is now, and so then we released the podcast episode, and then got a cease and desist letter from some woman who has a coaching business or something like that. But she goes, "You can't use someday is now." So then we're like, "Okay." So then we like someday is here, which actually is more impactful than now. I like here is a place word and. The initials for some days now is sin. So I'm really glad we have some days here. So some days here, the podcast released in 2019, which has been a joy to kind of elevate and, you know, just, I don't know, platforming other voices. But there's just so many fabulous, amazing leaders that mm. I think the world needs to hear. And it's been a resource for non-Asians to kind of be able to pull up a chair and learn about Asian American culture and history. Someday is here. Someday is here. That Russell. domino really fell and it has continued <laughs> to fall and just hit people. It's an incredible podcast. You're doing a great job. I feel like I'm honored talking to you because you like this professional podcast. Not even. <laughs> oh my goodness, no. So one of the things that I'm curious about, like from your standpoint, because I kind of alluded to this when we talked earlier about how culture has shifted in terms mm -hmm. of you mentioned, you know, being at UC Berkeley or being in Boulder and it was just kind of culture and ethnicity and how we talked about that, especially in 
faith communities was more in the background than mm-hmm. it is in the foreground now. And then a lot have happened in the last six, seven years as it relates to Asian American culture, yeah. it, positive, dynamic ways. You know, we just saw the Oscars and everything everywhere all at once, yeah. you know, crazy rich Asians. But then on the flip side, we've seen some horrific, yeah. you know, uh, abuses and attacks and yeah. into Asian hate. So I'm kind of curious about in this season right now that you're in, how do you think about the importance of what you're doing with, you know, someday is here and just in general, the moment, you know, what are ways in which you're hopeful? What are ways in which, you know, you might not be? Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. These years have been challenging. I mean, Mm. uh, it's challenging with a, a global pandemic, challenging with all that's transpired in our nation and around the world. Mm. Things that have happened in these last years, even in my own community, you know, just feeling like there's something shifted for for me in my community as well. Like I live in Southern California. There are a lot of Asian Americans here, but I I, I have been affected, I think, negatively in uh, feeling a lot more fearful, you mm-hmm. know. But I, I worry about my parents when they go to the grocery store. Um, my parents worry about their granddaughter being mm-hmm. out and about. There's just something that has shifted in the portrayal of this other, you know, going back to the very beginning, this being a perpetual foreigner, um, as an Asian, it doesn't feel safe. So even the rise in Asian American hate crimes, I believe it's over 300% Mm. increase. Um, There's something very, very challenging, and I feel it in my bones. And what motivates me to continue to minister in predominantly white spaces is that my hope is as I build trust with an audience, uh, no matter what the size is. Like I just spoke at a women's um, event recently and they have a lot of Asian neighbors, you know, but I was able to, as the time went on and trust was built and they knew that <laughs> I love God and I love the Bible, I respect men, like, <laughs> you know, just kind of clarifying some of these things. <laughs> but I just said, I just need you all to know that when you use a term like Kung flu or China virus, even in a joking way, it hurts my community. And if I'm not in those white spaces, there may not be someone who would say that. And so for me to stay in places where I, you know, I remember a friend of mine who was, you know, in Arkansas, I believe, and she said, I had no idea all this stuff was going on. Uh, She goes, but I commit to standing in and standing up for someone, you know? So I would hope that my white brothers and sisters and black brothers and sisters, everyone would step in if my parents were being mistreated. You know, but that really requires being there enough to say the words in a way that would be received and trusted. Mm -hmm. So I kind of consider myself a bridge person to come between these worlds. This is where you're from. I'm Rasul Berry. And remember, it's not just about where you're at. It's also about where you're from. This show was produced by Ryan Clevenger, Mary Jo Clark, and Jade Gustman, and was engineered by Kevin Burgess. I also want to thank Leah and Nicole for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries.